Today we come to the book of Obadiah, the shortest book in the Old Testament. Just a several judgment poems about one nation, not Israel, Edom. Now, who is Obadiah? Obadiah was the first of the prophets, which we call the pre exilic or the prophets before the exile. He was sent 300 years before the Babylonian exile. So basically, after him came many, many more prophets to warn God's people that one day, if they disobeyed God, they would go into exile. So can you imagine warning somebody for 300 years before the punishment? Now that's our God. People think God is like some kind of, you know, just burst out in anger and then judges his people, you know, and he's a, like a dictator. No, no, no. God's judgment came after 300 years of warning to the children of Israel through many, many different prophets, each one using a different method to try to, to try to uh, warn the children of Israel. Now the word Obadiah, the name means servant of Yahweh. Yah, Obadiah, all right, Yahweh. And uh, it could be servant of Yahweh or worshiper of Yahweh. Now, who were, who were the Edomites? The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. Now, we know that Esau and Jacob were two twin brothers born to Isaac. Now, there was huge rivalry between these two brothers. You, you, we've talked about that before. And that rivalry, sibling rivalry, largely because of favoritism from the dad and the mum, and that caused a rivalry that lasted 2,000 years. Again, a warning to all parents, please don't pit one child against another by favoritism. Sometimes you don't realize you're pitting one kid against another. You say, I, and I just like this guy more. Never, never bring it up. You may like someone more and that's natural, but never highlight it, never mention it. Both are your kids. Both are given by God. Love them, right? And be careful of starting rivalry. Now, Esau, was reddish in complexion or hair or whatever and therefore he was nicknamed Edom. Edom means red and his descendants were called Edomites. Jacob, when he had a breakthrough from God, was no more called Jacob because Jacob means deceiver. God gave him a new name, Israel. Prince of God. And so the descendants of Jacob are called Israelites. And the competition between the two Edomites, children of descendants of Esau, Israelites, descendants of Jacob, continued to be rivals for a long time. Just remember huh? the children of Abraham. Isaac and Ishmael. The rivalry continues till today. Almost 4,000 years. But thankfully, the competition between Israelites and Edomites ended 2,000 years ago simply because of this prophecy. Edomites don't exist anymore. There are no such people called Edomites. All right, Edom, the kingdom was across the Dead Sea on the eastern side. 
the Israelites live on the western side, right? And Edom became a very powerful place for two reasons. One, they dwelt in a place, today it's a tourist attraction. A million tourists a year go there. The city is called Petra. Petra is just the Greek word for rock, Peter. Petra, if you go as a tourist, is an amazing place. There are huge rooms, caverns, like cathedrals almost, built into the rock face, high up on the hills. And the Edomites were so proud of their uh, impregnable position because they live up there. You know, always in the old days warfare, when you are up there, just like in Jerusalem, up on Mount Zion, you always control the battle because basically you shot down your arrows at people. Arrows fought gravity to go up, right? So they, were, they felt they were impregnable. That made them very, very proud people. They looked down on others. They were really up there, literally looking down on others. Secondly, the position, geographical position of Petra was on a very important trade route between the rest of the world and Arabia. And so they also were rich. So they were militarily powerful and they were rich. And that made them proud. So let's just look. It's a very short book, so we can do this almost like a mini uh, quick Bible study. All right, let's look at verse 3. This describes them. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Wow! When this declaration was made to Edom, it was almost ridiculous. They were so powerful militarily, they were so prosperous economically, and who is this Obadiah to make this prophecy that we will be brought down? Okay? Now, why did God want to bring them down? Of course, we know pride. God just hates pride. When we are proud, God will bring us down. Okay? Because when you're proud, you look down on everybody. And eventually, you look down on God. I don't need God. Who needs God? I have everything. That's what rich people basically feel. Why do I need God? Tell me. You weak people down there, you need God because you're weak. That's how they feel. And so God, the moment God senses pride, he wakes. He knows it's going to lead to this horrible sin, right, of the creature daring to look down on the Creator who made him. So be careful about pride. The moment you have more wealth, you have more position, more reputation, my friend, whether it's religious, whether you're a pastor, nobody pastor become famous, my friend, keep low. Keep low. Because the tendency to pride is the road to death, <clears throat> destruction. Now, so we see here, God's going to destroy them. Let's look at verse 5 and verse 6. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed? Were they not steal only enough for themselves? If great gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. God says, 
you know, if thieves came to you, they just rob what they want. But for you, it will not just be a robbery, it will be a destruction. You will be pillaged, totally destroyed. You say, why God? I mean, you want to humble them? Just bring them back to ground zero and give them a chance again. I mean, after all, you say, if you're proud, you may look down on the Creator. So bring them down so they're not proud. Why do you want to destroy them utterly? Right? Let's look at verse 10 to verse 14, the reason for God's total destruction for them. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, Jacob's wealth, uh, Israel's wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not, just watch the do nots, do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. Wow. What was Edom guilty of besides pride? They were guilty of taking advantage of the Israelites whenever they were in distress. When Israel was attacked by any group of people, be it Philistines, Arabians, Babylonians, whatever, the Edomites always came in and took advantage of them. They saw they were helpless. The attackers had taken most of the stuff. They come in and they grabbed the rest of what they can. There were survivors. They grabbed the survivors and sold them as slaves. In other words, they took advantage of God's people's weaknesses in that time of weakness. This is the whole lesson of Obadiah. This little book is very important. Every leader in the world, national leader, has to read this one chapter Bible book because it is the theology for all nations in how they deal with God's people, whether they be Israelites or whether they be Christians. God's people, don't bully them. Don't take advantage of them when they are minorities, right? Every, relig every national leader must read this or face the wrath of God as Edom did. So I hope you see here that number one sin was not pride. And number one sin was oppression of the Israelites. They were not strong enough to attack Israel. They let the big powers attack them, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, whatever. But whenever Israel was weakened, they jumped in and took advantage, right? Then we see, is this a lesson just for Edom? Look at verse 15. <clears throat> For the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. You can underline that in your Bible. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. So the principle here is for all nations. The example is Edom. Edom took advantage of God's people. So God's going to really whack them. All nations, listen. You do the same, you get the same. Alright? 
So here we see here a very important lesson. And we will see it unfolding throughout history. Nations that were good to Israel, like Britain long ago, God bless. The day Britain stopped protecting Israel, the British Empire literally collapsed. America the same. America's power is not because the Americans are more brilliant than anybody else, because they protected Israel. The moment they stop, the mighty British Empire disappeared. It's no more British Empire. It's a joke now. The American power will also disappear the day they stopped protecting Israel. Same with Christians. Countries that persecute Christians. I don't care how mighty they are. There are some countries today, very powerful, they say the next economic power, the next economic power, and they punish, they persecute Christians. You think God's just sleeping? You think this book is about Edomites? All nations you've done unto them, I will do to you. All right? So God said he will annihilate, he will obliterate Edom. How, do we, how will he do it? Verse 19. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. History tells us people from the Negev desert, that's a desert south of this Edom, came and attacked them, the impregnable fortress, and they never really recovered after that. Now, history tells us that possibly the last Edomites were the dynasty of Herod. King Herod was an Edomite. He ruled during the time of Jesus. The scepter had left Israel, right? And Herod was actually not a Jew. He was an Edomite and he ruled. Herod the first, Herod second, Herod third, until his great grandson Agrippa. You can find his name in the Book of Acts. And then after that, that was about AD 100. We don't hear of Edomites anymore. Now, when, of course, when Obadiah made this prophecy, it sounded quite ridiculous. Obadiah saying, Esau will disappear. And then we go on to read. The last part of Obadiah, how Israel would grow bigger and bigger and take over these lands and be, finally become part of the eternal kingdom. Now, at the time when Obadiah made this prophecy, it looked exactly the opposite. Israel would disappear. It was getting weaker and weaker and weaker and powers were coming in, and Edom was still high and mighty. So when we read it now, it's like, yeah, yeah, okay. Edomites, no more, no big deal. But when Obadiah made this prophecy, people would say, are, are you sure you got it right? Edom will disappear. I thought Israel would disappear. Well, that's how prophecy works, okay? So today, there are no more Edomites. They don't exist. Obadiah prophesied that. It took a long time. A long time. God's judgments are sure. God's timing is not our timing. One day is like a thousand years. For God, it's one thousand years is just one day. Because in eternity, a thousand years is Less than one day is nothing, <laughs> all right? So just be sure, when God makes a judgment, it will come to pass. And you'll keep saying, when? When? I don't see it. I don't see it. Because your little time frame is so short. So at the end of it all, what was God actually doing? He was just fulfilling a promise he made to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, right at the beginning when he called Abraham, 
he made a promise. Genesis 12 verse 3, he said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. No said bless you, I bless them. Whether it's Britain, whether it's America, whatever, I don't know. Those that curse you, I will curse them. I'm glad my country, Singapore and Israel are the best of friends. I'm glad of that. And I see the prosperity of my land, Singapore, my country. It's not because we are smarter than anybody else. Some say it's our geography. Yeah, it does help to be in the right place. Certainly it does. But you can be in the right place. There are a lot of cities in the right place, very strategic, the miserable places. But Singapore is blessed because we value our relationship with a tiny country called Israel. So what do we learn from this tiny little book? We have learned that God is jealous for his children. Okay. I want you to understand the word jealous because even dictionaries don't understand the word anymore. They mix up the word jealousy and envy. Envy is I feel very sad that someone has some, some more than me. I want to take what he has so that I don't need to envy him. Jealousy is simply me being very protective of my possessions. I'm jealous for my wife. Why? She's my wife. I'm jealous for my reputation. It's right. It's my reputation. Don't take it and don't slander me. If you're not zealous for your possessions, I feel sorry for your wife. I feel sorry for your kids. I'm jealous for my kids. If anybody hurts my kids, gives them horrible influence, I will do something about it. Because I'm jealous for my kids. They are my precious kids. That's my precious wife. And people say, Wow, oh, God is a jealous God. He is jealous for his honor because he's honorable. He's jealous for his reputation. He's jealous for his glory because he's glorious. He's protecting his rightful position. He's not trying to say he's egoistical. He wants to take other people's glory. No, the glory belongs to him alone. Any other glory, any other ones take glory is crazy. All glory came from him. All power came from him. God takes away his power with dead ducks tomorrow. Dead. Right? So God is a jealous God. Understand that. This Bible tells us God is jealous for his people. And I'm thankful he's jealous for me. I'm his child. He's going to protect me. Anybody bullies me, God will deal with him. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful I had a good phys uh, biological father who loved me and protected me. I'm thankful for that. All right? So that principle is very important. God's children, whether it's Israel or whether it is Christians today. You know, when Saul was on the road to Damascus and he was struck by God down, the voice came, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul's thinking, I never persecute you, God. But actually Saul was persecuting God's people. As far as God is concerned, he was persecuting God. You touch my kids. You dare touch my kids. You touch my wife. You dare. She's part of me. All right? That's my God. I love this God. Because he's a real father. He stands by me. I am part of him. Wow. Jealous God. Jealous God. What kind of God is that? Best God is a jealous God, jealous for his. Any idol is jealous for his glory is insane. He didn't even make himself, he's made by a carver of wood or stone. But God, the 
glory is his, the power is his, everything is his. He's jealous for that. Right? If you read the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 25, God divides the nations, the sheep nations, the goat nations. How does he divide them? The sheep nations were those, he said, that fed me. They gave me water to drink when I had none. And then people said, I, how did I give water to you, God? In Matthew 25, verse 33 to 40, God said, when you give water, a glass of water to the least of my people, you did it to me. Hope you understand this. Take care of God's people. Lord will bless you. When people are nice to my kids, I'm very thankful. I'm grateful to them. Always. That's a father. People are wicked to my kids. I will protect my kids. I'll make sure that guy will never be wicked to my kids again. All right? So, I hope you understand this, okay? I hope national leaders understand this, that nations will be judged by their behavior to Christians and to Israel. This is really a tiny book, but it's probably the most important principle for any national leader to lead his country to success. It's not how great his economy is, how great his political savvy is, his strategy, but how much God blesses him. If he blesses God's people, I will bless them. That bless thee, God said. I will curse them that curse thee, because my children are precious to me, God says. Touch my children, you touch the apple of my eye. What's the apple of the eye? The iris. The most sensitive part of the eye. You touch eye. Straight away, there's a response. The moment you touch it, he, he will hit you back. Don't touch my eye. That is our God. Okay? So, little book. Great lessons about a jealous God. In a very real sense, it's very hard to touch God. He's high and lifted up. But in a real sense, it's very tempting to bully the people of God. Warning. Great warning. Even to you, Christian. Take care. Give a glass of cold water to the least of God's people. And you will be blessed. God bless you. We come now to a very familiar story of Jonah. Everybody knows this story. Every Christian, in fact, non-Christians also know this story. Though it's a familiar story, the truth is, very few Christians believe the story. Too many miracles. Sounds too strange to them. But more so, very, very few Christians really understand this story. They think it's about Jonah. But the truth is, this story is about you and me. About how narrow is our love about how we cannot stand that God loves our enemies. Though we are taught very much, as Christians, we must love our enemies, pray for them that persecute us. That's what we are taught. But the truth is, when God is merciful to our enemies, we cannot stand it. This is the story of Jonah. It's not about the story of a man and a fish. It's a story about you and me and our enemies and how God says, love your enemies 
Pray for them that persecute you. Pray for their salvation. How often have we done that? And if God really is merciful to save our enemies, are we even rejoicing? That's the story. I've just given you the summary. Now, Jonah is one of the very unusual prophetic books. Prophetic books are usually about the words of a prophet to someone. Thus said the Lord, thus said the Lord. But the book of Jonah is not about his words to others. It's about words about him. In other words, the story of his life. Okay, very unusual. In fact, it's not just a story. It's a satire. So what's a satire? A satire is a comedy that makes fun of people who think they're very high and great. And usually, for example, there will be political satires about our leaders who think they're very great and people make a little play. It doesn't say uh, that they are wicked, but it makes a comedy out of them that shows how foolish and ridiculous they are. So this is a satire of Jonah, but truly it's a satire of me and you. Okay, so let's get the background of the story. It is that Jonah is sent to preach to the city of Nineveh. Now Nineveh is the capital or was the capital of Assyria. Now Assyria was such a wicked kingdom compared to Egypt, for example. All right, Egypt would drown babies and leave the rest alive. Assyria had a terrible policy. They terrified their neighbors. They invented something called impaling. To impale was to put a sharp stake on the ground and let a person be poked right through on that stake and let him die slowly. It's kind of like crucifixion, but not exactly with your hands pierced and your, and your feet pierced. It's your belly pierced. You're hanging, you're there, impaled. And they didn't do it to one or two people. They did it to the entire population. So in other words, they wanted to terrify other cities, other countries, that if you don't surrender to us, you will be on that stake, impaled, right? So, of course, Jonah hated these people. They were so wicked. He's a prophet of God. He's a good man. And these are the most wicked people. And one day, God tells Jonah, go and preach to Nineveh. And, of course, Jonah freaks out. What? Preach to them? Now, so he ran away. Instead of going east to Nineveh, he ran west to get a boat, a ship, so he could sail as far away from Nineveh as possible. Now, the reason why he ran, people said, number one, maybe he's scared. He might be impaled. Imagine going to tell the king he's wicked. God said, you wouldn't preach to them. They're really wicked. They need a good preaching. So maybe he's scared. Possibly there was some emotion of fear. He's a human. Others would say, no, no, no. He's a fearless prophet. But he said in his mind, how could they even repent? Why bother to preach to people who are very unlikely to repent? I mean, if you have tried to share the gospel, how often do you share the gospel with the most wicked guy around you? In your mind, you say, don't waste my time. So maybe that was also in Jonah's mind. So he runs away. So the reason why he runs away is not mentioned. Or the main reason why he runs away is not mentioned in chapter 1, but it's mentioned in chapter 4. We'll come to that in a while. So he gets into this ship, and then a huge storm wax the ship, right? And when a huge storm wax the ship, the sailors fear. Now, the sailors are usually notorious for being godless. They drink, they're women in every port, 
and generally the stereotype of a sailor is a wicked fellow. But here we see the sailors fearing God. They said, God, this must be from God, this storm. And so they pray. And then they realize there's one guy sleeping in the deck who's not praying. Everybody's praying. This guy's sleeping. So they go wake up the prophet and say, pray. Can you imagine? Huh? This is satire, right? The guy who's supposed to be praying is asleep. The sailors who are supposed to never pray are praying. <clears throat> and then this, when, when Jonah comes up, they, they all cry out to God. Help us, God. And still the storm goes on. And then they decide, my goodness, there must be a sin among us that we need to find out. Imagine sailors saying that, right? And then they say, let's cast lots. Let's throw a dice, roll a dice or whatever, and find out who is the cause of God's anger on us. And lo and behold, it is Jonah. And so they ask Jonah, what in the world happened? All right? Why? Why are you the cause of this? And let us read now in Jonah chapter 1, verse 9 and verse 10. All right? In Jonah chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, they ask him, Tell us what's happening. Why are you the cause of this? And you see Jonah's very religious answer. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Wow, doesn't that sound so pious? I am a Hebrew, and I worship God who made the heaven and the earth. Now, if you worship God and you respect God, why did you disobey him? <laughs> this is a satire, right? This is ridiculous. You know, it's a lot of times we as Christians talk very pious. God's on the throne. God will take care of us. And then the next moment we worry about uh, COVID virus or whatever, as if God is not on the throne. Talk is always much, much further than our walk, right? Especially we are filled with Bible verses and our heart is tiny and our hands are non-existent, right? Our religion is head religion, not heart which is our love, our experience of God, experiential knowledge, not our hands, which are the fruit, the labor, or the result of our love for God and knowledge of God, right? So we have a head, big head religion, tiny heart religion, and no hand religion, okay? So he's talking big, right? And then in verse 10, then the men were exceedingly afraid. You, 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 you worship God, you, 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 you really worship God and God's punishing you. And said to him, what is this that you have done? You must have done something. All right? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So finally he had to admit my pompous words, I believe God is the God of heaven and earth, but actually I'm running away. How you run away from God who controls the heaven and the sea and everything? Where do you want to run to? The sea, you cannot run. The land, you cannot run. Heaven, you cannot run because God's everything, right? So why you run? Right? And so Jonah then has to admit, right, that he is the cause of all this. So... They try to, to continue praying, but the, 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 the waves became even more. So Jonah said, you just throw me into the sea. That, that will stop it because God's angry with me. But the sailors were so God-fearing. They, they were afraid to murder a man of God. So they tried to row and row, but the, the sea became more tumultuous, tempestuous. And finally, they had no choice, but they threw him into the sea. And you know what? The storm stopped immediately. And the Bible says they worshipped God. All right? 
I, I like this satire, you know. The godless people understand the warnings of God. The godless people pray. The godless people right, were fearful to kill a man of God. And then when all this happened, straight away, they worshipped. Now the Bible, it almost sounds like Jonah is very, very noble, you know, he's going to sacrifice his life for these guys. Sounds, sounds good. Jonah said, throw me in the sea. But actually, I don't think it was that good. He's just running away from God. Right? So, if I'm going to run from God, I can't get, he's the God of lands here. Now just take my life away. Let me die. At least I don't have to go and preach to these awful Ninevites. Right? And but God didn't let him die. God prepared a fish for him, a big fish, right? So that's chapter one. In chapter two, he's in the belly of this big fish, possibly a whale. Whales are massive, right? The biggest mammals on earth by far, right? Elephants are tiny next to a massive whale. And he's in the stomach of a whale. But of course, you know, in our stomach, there's gas in it. I'm a gassy guy, I got a lot of gas in my stomach. Imagine in a wheel, the bubble of gas might be massive because his belly is massive and he's probably in this one of these gas bubbles and able to breathe. And so he prays to God and he cries out to God. Not repentance, he didn't repent. He, in the entire prayer, never once said, God, I'm sorry I ran away. He didn't. He just says, God, thank you for keeping me alive. Thank you for still remembering me. Thank you, I can still pray to you in the belly of this fish. And salvation belongs to you. I mean, you're the one that can save me from death. And you know what? The word salvation belongs to God is actually found in uh, verse 9 in chapter 2. It's not talking about eternal salvation. You always think salvation has only got one meaning, all right? Salvation means to save somebody from problems, right? Of course, when we say for, in a spiritual sense, we want the real eternal salvation, right? Which is forever and ever, right? You don't want to save me from a virus or a flu or a stomach ache. That's, it's still, we pray to God, please save me from this terrible pain or fear or whatever. And so the fish vomits him out. <laughs> he can't run away. He, he, he worships the God of the land, the sea. So how to run? You can't run, but the idiot runs away, right? That's a satire. Sometimes we talk like that, but we try to we do the opposite, right? So he finally comes out. He's vomited out on a land, and God says, go to Nineveh, preach to them. Okay, so he walks to Nineveh. Probably looking pretty horrible. I mean, in the fish belly, though he's in oxygen, there's a lot of acid in a mammal's stomach. I think I had learned enough science to know. Acid can do quite horrible things to your skin. So he probably is pretty burned, acid burned. And the stomach is very acidic, right? So I don't know what he looked like. He probably didn't look like a normal skin after being burned by acid. So this ugly looking... Uh, Jonah now, all right, walks there. You know, even in chapter 2, he says he had seaweeds around him and all that. Hey, I think in the belly, if you eat tons of veggies, you know, you get a lot of vegetables still undigested in the stomach before it goes to the small intestines. So, you know, if you were to, uh, a, a critter, a creature swallowed by a human being, you will see a lot of vegetables running uh, around you and in the stomach. Huh? Okay? So, anyway, He's, he's vomited out, this ugly looking guy, and he has to go to Nineveh now, and he is mad, it's a massive city, it takes three days to walk through the city, right? Now, of course, when you walk through a city, you don't just run through a city, I mean, you walk through the streets, you, you know, and it, it's a big city, the biggest in the world at that time, probably, and uh, he has to preach a very, I still to preach. So he just preaches this basic thing, which is found in chapter 3. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's all he's going to say. Now in Hebrew, that's only five words. It's a five word 
So, in this sermon is very interesting. It doesn't say what their sin is. It doesn't say what they're supposed to do. It doesn't even mention God. I would call this the most minimal sermon I can you can ever preach. How do you preach a sermon like that? I mean, even if you you wanted to preach anything less than this, it's almost impossible. This is the minimal sermon. It's almost like Jonah had to do a job, but he wasn't going to do a good job. God said, we'll warn them. At least warn them their sin, their violence, impaling people, punishing widows, children, harmless people, innocent people, plundering them. Mention their sin, at least. And then say, you have to repent to God. Tell them how to get out of it. I mean, that's preaching, right? And tell them God will judge you. But not a word about these things. So it's like he doesn't really want to preach. And he's barely one third way into the city, just screaming out these five words, like no choice. And then it says, all the people, all the people began to fast and put sackcloth on them. They believed him. Wow. You know, sometimes if you have tried to evangelize people, sometimes just one verse, one verse, the Bible, which sometimes is not even the John 3, 16 type of verse, and people get saved. I've heard people telling me, Pastor, do you remember you said this? I said, uh, no. You know, you came to my church such and such a time, or you came to this conference such and such a time, you said, this verse or you said this statement, you know, it changed my life totally. I was like going the wrong direction. I was not a baby, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm a preacher. Now I'm a pastor. Now I'm a missionary. It's like, uh, really? Uh, I don't remember saying it. And that verse you're taking out of, a bit out of context, you know. I didn't, if I said it, I didn't mean it that way. But, you know, the word of God is powerful, right? <laughs> God said, go and say something you just say, right? And so they, they fasted and they put sackcloth and the king heard about it. And he proclaimed a national fast that everybody, including the animals, should not eat, should put sackcloth, ashes on them and pray for mercy. My goodness, I wish I could ever see a revival like that. It was a national revival of the most wicked kingdom in the world. Possibly the most arrogant people. And you know what? God accepted their repentance. God accepted their plea of mercy. And God did not overthrow the city. You mean after murdering millions of people, after ruining millions of lives and nations, they just wear sackcloth and cry out to God from their heart, Lord have mercy on us. What kind of maybe they didn't even mention their 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 prayer, their, their sins. Maybe they don't know how to pray, but repentance is change of heart. That we will. We can do anything we like and suddenly we realize, no, we can't. Heart turns, repentance, change of mind. And suddenly we realize, oh God, we didn't know there was a God there. We're sorry, God. We are nobody. We are not Assyrian power, uh, the greatest nation. We are nobody. Forgive us, God. And God accepted it. Wow. Some people say, the word overthrown. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Some people say the word overthrown has two meanings in Hebrew. I don't know. I don't know Hebrew, so I'm just sharing what some writers say. Overturned can mean to utterly demolish. Something powerful becomes something nothing, right? It's overturned like Sodom or Gomorrah, but it can also mean 
it's turned around. Turn it over. In other words, from arrogance to humility. 40 days and Nineveh shall be turned. But it was not 40 days. It was less. <laughs> it was very fast. <laughs> okay. So anyway, whatever it is, there was a national repentance and God accepted it. Chapter 5. Uh, chapter 4. Jonah is furious. He is so angry with God. And now we find out the reason why he ran away. It was not fear. It's not that he thought they would not believe, they would be resistant to preaching. That's why why bother? Why risk my life and waste my time? I run away. We thought that was the reason. Jonah gives his reason before God now in chapter 4. All right? Let's read chapter 4. And this is very interesting. If we don't understand this, we will always have what I call the Sunday school version of Jonah. Jonah is in a whale's stomach and God spat him out. And you know, we, we know the story, we don't know the meaning, which is mostly our understanding of the Bible. We know the stories, but not the meaning. And often we only know the meaning for me, right? Not so much the meaning to help us understand God. All right, let's look at Jonah in verses. Um, in verse chapter four, verse one, but it did, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. This repentance of this and God accepting it, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, "Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country, when God had told him to preach? He said, is not this what I said to you? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. That's the reason now, for I knew that you are a gracious God." and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Now, that's the reason why Jonah ran away. He knew God was merciful, and if he preached, God might forgive his enemies. And that was not acceptable to Jonah. He hated his enemies. Why should they be blessed by God? Do you, think, do you think this is only in Jonah's heart today? Do you think this feeling is only in Jonah's heart? Is this a story of Jonah? Or is this a satire of Jonah? Or is this a satire of PC and you? That we hate our enemies. We can hear the preaching, love your enemies, pray for them that persecute you, that you may be like the sons of God, sons of your Father with who is in heaven. Wow, sounds so spiritual, huh? But is that really how our heart is? Is that the whiteness of our heart? All right. And so he's angry with God. Then he said to God, Therefore now, O Lord, take, please take my life from me. Verse 3. For it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, verse 4, Do you well to be angry? Is it justified for you to be angry that I spared people from horrible destruction? Jonah didn't bother to answer God. Verse 5, Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, and made a booth for himself there. So he walks on to the city, goes to the east side. I guess it's more shaded there. He makes a little shade, sits and watches the city from the outside and says, I hope God changes his mind and destroys them. I hope so. Or maybe I hope they, 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 
repentance is fake and now they start to party and then God will just punish them because they, they've just pretended to repent. I hope so. So he sits there waiting, right? And you know what? God is so merciful. God does a miracle, makes a vine grow really fast on his little, he made a little, you know, a few sticks to shatter, shelter him from the hot sun. He's outside of the city, so he makes a little shade there. And God makes a vine grow on it. Vines grow on a scaffolding. And this vine grows at top speed. Vines usually have these big leaves and a big gourd, you know, like melon kind of thing. And it provides him more than his little stick shade shed can provide him. So he's now nice and comfortable. He's, he's still waiting there for the destruction of Nineveh. It doesn't happen. And the next morning he wakes up still waiting. Now what God does is he, he prepares a worm to eat up the roots of this vine and then the vine shrivels up, the leaves shrivel up and the gourd shrivels up and he then allows the scorching sun and the east wind. The east wind is a very hot wind that comes from the desert. And, and Jonah is miserable in the heat now. He's angry inside. He's hot outside. All right. And he tells God, it's better for me to die. And then God says to him in verse 9, that God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? You see, the plant had died and Jonah is so angry. Why you take away my plant? It gave me shade. It's the only comforter I have. I'm so angry. And then, the only thing that gave me comfort was this plan, you take it away. What's wrong with you, God? Right? He's angry with God. But God said to Jonah, verse 9, Do you well to be angry for the plant? And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perish in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, children, little kids, 120,000 little kids, and there's a lot of people in that city, and also much cattle. God said, you, I need permission to from you to kill the vine, right? You're angry at me because I didn't ask you permission to kill the vine. Can I have your permission now to be kind to a city with 120,000 children, infants, and much cattle? Can I have your permission not to destroy this city? It's kind of satire, sarcasm. Then the story ends there. You don't know what Jonah answered. I have no idea. Why did God not answer? Why did God not show Jonah's response? Because it's this story. It's not about Jonah. It's about you and me. <laughs> All right? You see, when people tell the story of Jonah, they talk about Jonah. It's not about Jonah. Otherwise, this ending is ridiculous. Nothing from Jonah. So, how do I do a character study? Was he repented? Maybe he was. I don't know. Maybe he said, God, I'm so sorry, forgive me. But we are left hanging because it's not about him. It's nothing to do with him. He's just there, a character for you and me to see ourselves reflected in the mirror. Because honestly, if you ask Christians, you know, you heard this from Matthew chapter 5, right? Verse 44, love your enemies, right? Yeah, yeah, Pastor, I know. You think you can do it? Yeah, I think I can. I mean, God asked me to, but I think I can. Really? If our enemies, horrible people, have done terrible things to us, and God in His great mercy, because this fellow who, who tormented you for 50 years of your life one day, said, sorry God, and turns around, and God just forgives him. Can you handle that? Is your 
love in your heart big enough to even grasp the love in God's heart? Or is my love so tiny that I be angry with God because His love is big? I cannot accept that His love is so big. That's, that's the moral of this story. The greatness of God's love. The acceptance of God of repentance. Hundred year life of rottenness. Deathbed. I'm sorry, God. He goes to heaven like you and me. Can you accept that? If he's personally tormented you. Alright. I think our heart is so tiny. So tiny. That when we are confronted with a love of God that is so great, a forgiveness that is so huge, we cannot accept it. Are you okay with such a God who is such a big love, even for your enemies? I'm not even asking, will you pray for them? I mean, will you just accept a God like that? It's hard. Believe me. So God does teaches us in the Bible many ways. Sometimes by poetry. Sometimes by satire. Satire. You know when you have a great king, it's very hard to correct him by telling him what's wrong with him and lecturing him. He probably will never accept it. Then people do satires hoping, hoping. He can see himself in it, hoping that this method will change him. So God's using Jonah to change us, to understand the love of God so big, like the heavens, forgiveness so free, hard to imagine, and worse than that, hard to accept. May God give you a beautiful glimpse of the greatness of God's love, mercy, and forgiveness. And may we love this God, not get angry with this God, this God of great mercy. I hope this Bible study will be a good reminder and more than that a good slap on our face may god bless this bible study may you know your god